Okay, guys. Um, ah, perfect. Uh, we are starting. So with our first hand hand on a session, and for this, Lydia Helruk came from Zurich. We're very happy that you came in person. Um, she's a postdoc at the University of Zurich, and she's working with neurofeedback and and fMRI, uh, more from the computational side. And yeah, we're very excited to hear what she has to say and teach us. Have to press anything or is it everything is, uh, should be working yes okay. we can hear you. so thanks a lot um thanks the organizers for having me today um and maybe as a short preparation before i start talking uh, too long um we my idea is that we do a, a very little hands-on session um we need a matlab uh, and I heard that at least for some of you, it's still normal to have it on your computers already. <laughs> I hope at least a few have it, um, because then we can run a little script um, and look a little bit at, uh, at fMRI. And I prepared some some data and everything we need, and which you could download from here. Uh, and I send it on on the chat. And what is the question on chat? Ah, it's sent to everyone then. Okay. Um, and so while I'm talking, you might open this already, and uh, I start from the from the beginning. So the topic today uh, is data inspection uh, in FMI data. Uh, I would like to give you a short uh, introduction and a little hands-on session. And uh, what qualifies me to be here and uh, to talk about this? So. Uh, I'm by education a computer scientist, uh, and then for my PhD, I switched uh, fields a little bit. So during computer studying computer sciences, um, I've been in this all thing of uh, neuroinformatics being uh, more robotics and how to teach a robot to learn something. Uh, and after that, I was really curious to get to know more about the real human brain. So not only about algorithms, but how is the human brain really uh, working and how is learning working. So I, I switched to cognitive neuroscience uh, and uh, I'm working with real-time fMRI neurofeedback. So I put participants inside uh, an fMRI scanner uh, and then I take brain signal from the participants while they're lying inside the scanner, give them back as a feedback uh, and then they learn to self-modulate their brain behavior. Uh, and all this I do in the, in the context of the dopaminergic, so the motivation and the learning system uh, combined with decision-making tasks. Uh, and how come that I'm here today? So uh, Nina Wiedemann, one of your organizers, um, was my research assistant uh, for quite a while and it was really fun working with it. Uh, and um, Janet was my, one of my guinea pigs in the, in the last study which was a really cool one and uh, we have really nice data now so uh let's start in case so what is life as a phd student uh, what is my my generic theme for today before bothering you with some specifics about fmi so in general, we all acquire some data, no matter which data, uh, but your PI wants you to get some data. So I was looking for this uh, little comic. Uh, and then the question of course is from your PI at some point, so how's your data looking? And then you have, yeah. Um, um, so here they, they make the fun uh, that he's starting with, uh, they are good, uh, yeah, but they should be great. Uh, and then, uh, He's making it worse with asking a funny question. Can I still graduate? So at some point, your PI will ask you about your data. So my generic topic is today, please look at your data. I don't care which data you have, uh, but of course I had to choose an example for today. Uh, but so many things get, can go wrong and you cannot imagine how often I had these discussions already that people have already analyzed data and say like, yeah, our hypothesis is wrong. That the, the result is not as we expected it. And then you ask the very first question is, yeah, is there any outlier in your data? What? I don't know. <laughs> really? Um, so things can go wrong on the way. Um, and this is true for all brain imaging methods. So I'm coming from brain imaging, but 
related to the topic before, right? Uh, he was talking about overfitting of the data. Um, the, the idea behind is the same, right? So I have to check your data carefully. Uh, and of course, then it's totally different what you have to check for, but, but the idea is still the same. Please think about uh, what might go wrong. So in brain imaging, uh, and this is our example for today, um, we have this huge MR scanner. So is anybody of you working with fMRI data? Least a few. Um, I will give a very short introduction then what it really means. So it's this huge thingy, very, very loud, very, very, you know, very squeezed in. Uh, and this gives us functional data of uh, our brain. Um, there's EEG with these electrodes on the, on the scalp um, where you acquire uh, data um, from, the, from the skull of the brain. Uh, but the same is for, for MEG, where you, it's also a magnetic thing, but uh, it's here just above your head. Uh, and there's also this um, near infrared spectroscopy. Uh, and nowadays, there's, there are even um, uh, ultrasonic devices on their way. So that's really fancy. Uh, not working properly yet, but that's on the way. Um, yeah. So you can acquire different data from the brain. Um, you can also think of uh, artificial brain thinking, whatever. Since I'm working with fMRI all day long and uh, for several years now, I decided to give you an example with fMRI preprocessing. So since just a few of you said they're working with fMRI, this is the shortest intro I can give at all to fMRI. <laughs> what are we talking about? What are we looking at? So there's a link between you, like, Activity, the blood flow, and the oxygen saturation inside the brain. Uh, and all this is called the neurovascular coupling. So what is neural activity doing? So when you do something specific, like reading or calculation, different brain areas are active. And while they are active, they are using oxygen. Uh, and when they are using up oxygen, the blood is less oxygenated because they're using up the oxygen. And this uh, you can detect uh, with the so-called blood oxygen level dependent contrast. Uh, Mr. Ogawa figured out in 1980, which is quite a while ago. Um, and then it took a few years before it was possible um, to acquire this and just to translate this in an imaging signal. Uh, and what we can do is that in this MR signaling, uh, so with giving pulses on the brain uh, and acquiring <laughs> relaxation times, they are called. So how long, long does the tissue need to get back to the normal state? You can detect differences between brain regions that are active and some that are not active. Uh, so what belongs to, I always call it fMRI, but that's not very precise. So in what, what we need are different um, imaging uh, modalities, in this case, different things that we look at. And the first thing at this, when you see a documentary about whatever, that, that's always the thing what they show, but this is not fMRI, this is the structural scan. So this is the high resolution image of your brain, which shows the structure of your brain. So first of all, you look, is there a brain? And if there's one, uh, does it look somewhat normal, does it have huge holes um, or is there something very strange going on? And then this fMRI signal is dependent on a different contrast and this contrast is called T2 star. Uh, and this looks way more noisy as you can already see. Uh, and it's not fully the opposite, but a little bit like, like the opposite, right? So there you don't wanna see the, the structure of the brain, but you want to see what I said before, this oxygenation uh, levels in there. Uh, and therefore you would weight differently what you want to see. Uh, and this looks way more noisy and has a, a way less resolution. So this is three by three by three millimeters approximately, something around that, but more but less. Uh, and then you're inside of a, a scanner and you have this round bore, and this is a very sensitive thing. So there's a magnetic field in there. Uh, and now you can imagine uh, magnetic fields are somewhat sensitive. So 
if there's something in either in the scanner itself or if there's something inside you like a retainer or some metal whatever um the, the whole field is distorted and uh, so what you acquire in addition is a B0 field map, which acquires how good, how stable is my field. And this we also have to take into account. And then in addition, uh, which is really, go I would say golden standard nowadays, that you do um, electrocardiogram, so heart rate um, recordings with electrodes, uh, and also uh, breathing recordings. Uh, because it has been shown in I don't know how many thousand times that different breathing uh, and also like when your heart rate, heartbeat changes, um, that this influences um, the, the neural activity signaling. So it's more or less this we want to get rid of. And to be able to do that, we have to acquire the data. This we have to use for correction. This is what we want in general, but to be able to interpret these data, we need also structural data because otherwise we don't have any idea where we are in the brain. Might be everything. Um, so, <laughs> the shortest explanation I ever gave. How, how does it look like for the ones who, who never worked with it? So, we acquire these T2 star data in a, in a stack, uh, and, that, and that's a volume. So, we go through the brain like this, and then it's 20, 30, 40 slides, uh, something around that to acquire the full brain. And that's also the big advantage of FMI. We can acquire the whole brain at once. And this takes something between one and two seconds. And this we repeat all the time. So we acquire many of them over time. And while we are doing it, we apply, and this is called stimulation. And this is the same also for all other imaging uh, things you apply something to the participant. In this case, uh, I sh I've show you some pictures, and here's a very cute one. And uh, the opposite is a very ugly picture, at least for some. And then we repeat this again, right? This is a friendly person, and this is a not very friendly person. And this is repeated all the time, while every two seconds, one full volume of the brain is acquired. So let's code these different things with different colors um, and say like these are different conditions. So the one is a cute one, the other one is an ugly one, this is a friendly one, it's an unfriendly one. Positive and negative emotions. So what we do now over time, we do and do and do and do. Uh, and each color here now is an event. So each picture is an event. And we continue this. For each, each event, courses, this bold signal, what I said before, right? So you see this and in your emotional system, there's an increase uh, in this uh, deoxygenated blood. And that's why you have less distortions in your brain signal. And that's why you have, can see this effect. And now this is done over time, right? So for all these things, and now a little bit coded, like this friendly one is, uh, activating your emotional system less than, than uh, the, the yellow one, maybe. Uh, and we continue doing that and we can assess these amplitudes. Uh, and now what we have in the brain, in, in every of these slices, every slice contains of uh, voxels. Uh, it's just a 3D pixel uh, because it, it also has a Z direction. And in each voxel, we now look what these different simulations are doing. Uh, and depending on if it's reactive to emotions or not, it will change it at its activity. And this we do now for each slice, for in each slice, for each voxel. Uh, that's a univariate analysis, but you can do exactly the same with methods that you learned before. So you can apply multivariate uh, analysis to that thing, extract some features from it, whatever. Uh, and each voxel will represent different activity. This might be the brain area reacting to the to this cute little animal, uh, and another one might react to the ugly animals. Uh, and then again, for each condition, different voxels uh, are taking care of it. So what at the end, then in an overview, what you see and what we are aiming for in fMRI are statistical maps of brain activity. And in this example, it's the negative pics versus the neutral pics. And then 
throughout the whole brain, what we end up with is a statistical value of uh, how representative is this voxel in the brain for this contrast, right? So how reactive is this to negative stimuli? Uh, and then here, the most relevant one is the, the amygdala. You might have heard of this signal, um, which is really prominent for emotion processing. And then you know, like, oh, 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 amygdala is relevant uh, for that. Th that's the whole thing we want to do. Uh, this is like the, the summary of what we are aiming for, but on the way to this map, every, many things can go wrong. <laughs> and it happens also. <laughs> and then you end up with an empty brain, and then your supervisor might say like, oh, really? <laughs> but there must be something, <laughs> because this is our main effect. <laughs> this is not a specific, it's the main effect. Um, but that's like the, the first home. Always think about the main effects, right? So never start with your hypothesis because that's the new part. Think about what's known already and have a look at the result if it looks as what you're aiming for. So I shortly look to the chat if there are questions. If I make it. So I don't see the questions here, right? Or some. Old ones, okay. Okay, if there are questions, let me know. Uh, otherwise, now we uh, continue. So we are aiming for, for some maps. So on the way to there, uh, as I told you, we have the T1 data, we have the T2 star data, we have the B0 field map, and we have this physiological data. So what are we supposed to do? We have raw fMRI data. And from these data, first of all, um, when you acquire this, this T1 contrast, uh, you, you also assess the, the rest of the brain, right? Because it, um, it shows all structures in the brain, but there's also a skull, there's your neck, there are your bones, everything's in there. So the first thing you have to do is you have to extract the, the brain, uh, which means you have to make assumptions, uh, which parts are brain, which parts are bones, and then um, take that out. Uh, and, and find a good solution. The second thing is, as I told you, these fMRI data, every two seconds, every se two seconds, uh, a new volume is acquired. And this is on a range from a few minutes to, yeah, good experiment, 30 minutes, bad experiments, an hour. Um, so, and the participants are lying in the scanner for this whole time. Every two seconds, a new uh, volume has been acquired. Uh, and you can imagine the participants are not able to not move at all during that time. Uh, so what you have to check for is uh, how is the participant moving over time? Uh, and since we are, whatever your resolution in your fMRI data is, so let's assume three millimeters, um, then you can correct for something that is moving three, millimeters to some direction, but it's getting complicated if it's more far than that. So you have to check for that. The next thing is uh, what I said before, right? So there, there might be something really strange uh, either in the, in the scanner or in the participant and really tiny things are enough to cause susceptibility distortions. I will show you a better example than this uh, in, a, in a minute. So, and then what do we want to do? So. We want to bring together the T1 data with the fMRI data because otherwise we, at the end, we don't know where exactly the, the brain activity is. Uh, we have to correct for, for um, inhumanities in the, in the field. So we need this B0 field map. Uh, and we want to take out the physiological confounds. Uh, so we have to bring them all together. Uh, but for the, for the first part, we have to align these different images. Uh, and this comes with uh, quite heavy algorithms. Uh, so here you really do warping algorithms to bring them together because they are really totally different. And then there's, there's one more uh, step with this MNI 152, that uh, mysterious uh, wording. What you want to do at the end is uh, you always have your individual participants, uh, but it doesn't help you um, if you want, because you, you always need more participants. And this is just the, the name of the, of the template most people are um, taking to normalize their data. But again, a normalization to a template from an individual contains really heavy algorithms in terms of 
we are stretching the data, we are warping the data, we are squeezing them on some template, and this might fail. Uh, <laughs> and then at the last step, we have these uh, confounds with the physiology that we have to take out. So all these steps. Um, so let's uh, have a look here, what I said before. So we have this, this template image, and this is taken from, where's the name coming from? 152 uh, participants data, and they calculated the mean of these 152 participants. So they, uh, this is the, the template. And now we want to squeeze in your individual participant onto this template. And what you do for this, you do some translations, you do some rotations. Um, this is still pretty simple and hardly fails. Maybe you have to zoom, uh, but then it's getting complicated. Uh, you might have to shear. There it's already uh, getting a bit complicated. Uh, or you even have to warp the whole thing. So here it's even written 12 degrees of freedom uh, that we have three translation, three rotation, three zoom, three shears. This is the thing we are dealing in. Yes, to, uh, to some extent. So it's like um, uh, when you when you like check for the for the motion within the fMRI data. <laughs> This can be like done, done at the same time as you extract the brain from the T1 data, right? So this doesn't matter. But like bringing them, them together, uh, you only want to bring the fMRI data to the T1 data after you've done the motion correction. And there are some other small steps like slice timing. I, I did not mention it here because it's really in very detailed. Uh, and there you also have to take into account the order. Um, so and uh, also like um, with the with the B zero field map. So the first step you are doing from this B zero field map, you have to calculate something that you can your transformation matrix to your fMRI space, and this you can do first, um, also independently from the rest. But then the the application you also do after the motion correction. So you. So at the end, you you, can, you calculate different trans transformation matrices, but then the application of these transformation matrices to the real data, this you have to do in the correct order. Um, that fits quite well. <laughs> Let me think about it. So the very last step, but that's not a transformation at all. It's, it's moving. That, that's like the very, very last step. Uh, but that's also clear why you do it at the very end, right? Because you destroy a little bit your resolution, but to harm everything. Yeah, but that's a rather simple summary. First, linear transformation, then nonlinear. Okay, so you've seen this now several times while I was talking. <laughs> I hope you remember. Uh, and then the, the second and a bit more, I, I talked before already, but here a bit more obvious. That's the anatomical image, high resolution. This is functional, very rather low resolution. And now we have to align these two uh, image things. And you already see that it's getting way more complicated. So you need something like mutual information to, uh, to even find where they are corresponding. Um, what's because um, the FMI data. Uh, so that the functional data that can even be a partial volume right so that it's not necessarily the full volume of the brain uh, because if you want to increase resolution uh, you might get stuck with time and then you just take a partial volume if you have a very dedicated region brain region you are looking at so uh, and then you you really have to look which structures are there that that are matching like the like the ventricles they are very prominent they have the opposite contrast between the two, but this you can detect. Uh, and then you also, uh, that, and then you, you, after bringing them together, and there you really also have to warp and stretch the whole thing. Um, and then you, you bring both to this template 
space, right? So that you at the end can compare between different participants. Uh, and yeah, to also, uh, and then one more thing, as I said, uh, this uh, physiological noise correction. So what uh, what do we have to do for that? So independent of of the whole rest, uh, the first job is that you that you have to uh, assess: is it breathing or is it noise? And that's uh, and then for the for the heartbeat, you also need something to de to detect the heartbeats. Uh, and sometimes there will be missing heartbeats. Um, so you need a proper method to detect that. Um, then to take that into account at the end uh, as a as a confound uh, regressor, and also this, uh, oh, yeah, you can misdetect heartbeats, right? So you say that's a heartbeat, but it's not, and um, then you might take out real data from your from your fMI data, um, just because this algorithm is not working properly. So apparently, I changed the order. So. Um, then before the, the, the summary slide, so there are two boxes available for fMI data processing, uh, as you can imagine, and analysis. So in short, and this is what all of you who like to, um, is, the, is the one at the, um, I'm showing you something with today, is called SPN, Statistical Parametric Mapping. It's a very prominent one from London. It's uh, based on, it's, it's a MATLAB toolbox. You can complain about not MATLAB as much as you want. I, I have many other complaints, um, but still. So this is one of the oldest toolboxes. They started very early. They have, they, they came up with a lot of algorithms um, of, of how to deal with the data. Uh, and the second most prominent, and they both came up at the same time. And this one is from Oxford. It's called FSL. FSL is um, more more Linux based and more scripted. So this is really uh, going yeah way more clearly in uh, in batch scripted way and this was uh, a bit more uh, gui like from the very beginning um but still the gui looks okay so there's also the acne toolbox uh, and if you think of bad guis this is the this is the best one <laughs> So um, Acne uh, has been developed in the in the US. Uh, it's also with regard to the algorithms behind. It's quite powerful, but um, the documentation of Acne says like the code is documentation enough, um, and mm, th th that's why this um, is for a beginner quite hard. But feel free to use it. <laughs> Nowadays, it's utilized by FMI Prep. For FMI Prep. Is a, is a full pipeline to simplify the whole thing and also to switch between these different uh, toolboxes. It's quite powerful, um, but lacking something that I will show you today. Um, this is for normalization and it's also utilized by the FMI prep and for completeness here is also the link to the FMI prep. So um, it's very likely if you start with FMI data today that your PI will ask you about this if you can't use that. Um, it's all based uh, on a on a data format that is called bits, but that's a detail you should have heard about it. There's a standard format for FMI data, and this is based on that. And then there's a free server, but that's for structural MR images only. So uh, checking for differences in brain tissue before and after some intervention, you give them some drugs or you do some training with your participants and you want to see if, if brain tissue in some specific area either increased or decreased due to the training, uh, then preserver is the tool to go for. Nonetheless, all of them using algorithms that I've shown you before um, and everything is scripted. So what's the point? Uh, why am I standing here? Uh, you, you have your script from your previous PhD student that your PI gives to you and says like, yeah, do this analysis. Everything has been done before. Um, and then you wonder why you end up with no results. So I try to convince you that in the in the background of all these toolboxes, rather heavy processing is going on, and these algorithms might fail. <laughs> They're using optimization procedures. There are local minima, maxima. They get stuck in it, uh, and they might fail on an individual level. And since your study is not comprising a single participant, but nowadays at least forty, better sixty, something like that. You have many and several sessions, maybe. 
So participants came in several times. So you have a lot of data, a lot of um, individuals, and you put them together in a, in a group analysis. And a single participant that fails is destroying your whole group level analysis. Uh, because that's then the outlier, and then you, you have nothing. Uh, and if you, if you didn't check that, so of course you can say like, okay, if my results are fine, then I, then, then everything is fine. Um, but if not, you have to go back anyway, or from the very beginning, you say like, I look at, um, if everything is valid and I'm allowed to do the group level analysis. So otherwise you might end up like this guy uh, and making it even worse. So first look at your data before you go to your PI. <laughs> um what can cause these algorithms to fail so fmi is really sensitive to several things and something that is very very often and it's a bit hard to see here maybe at the screens uh, at home it's better so here you see these rings in there and this happens because they are slightly moving and really continuous moving of one millimeter, but doing it all the time. And, and it's participants for instance lying in there and just doing this. So they're lying in the scanner, they're not moving their head, but doing this because they are, I don't know for what reason they're doing it, but some of them are doing it. And then your results look like this. Then. So you have these rings throughout the, the brain and this might cause the algorithms for not detecting properly the, the match to the T1 data. The second one um, that always looks funny and um, you, you wonder <laughs> why this, this can happen. It's again, hard to see here. I hope it's better at the screen. So here you have the, the brain data, but what you see here is half of the brain here and half of the brain here. And it happens a lot uh, and it's quite easy to happen. So when you acquire your data, you have a slice package. I'll demonstrate here. So at, at the scanner, you have a box that you place where your data is. And if you place your box, normally you put the brain inside the scanner, but some participants have a huge head, so you have to make a decision. And if you put the, the box like this and the nose is looking a bit out, then you're folding in. It's possible that at this border, the brain is folded back. And that's the, the, the ghosting artifact. So if, you, if your brain starts, and most of the case, if you see the border, out, uh, the, the nose outside of this uh, border, then it can happen very easily. That then the, the brain itself is folded back due to how the pulses work and how the signal is then transformed from the Fourier space to your image space, um, that you have half of the brain folded back in. And this happens really a lot if you if you do not take care of that and look at it already at the scanner. So I've, I've seen this very often. Uh, and the third most prominent, there are more examples, but uh, this is one I, I brought you. So this is like a very normal distortion. Um, it's at the orbit, uh, orbitofrontal cortex. Uh, and this is just because the slice package that you acquire is always quite close to the border of the brain. Uh, and then there are always a little distortions uh, at this. And, and this is really like somewhat normal. So if a participant has a uh, bit bigger brain uh, than, than others, this, this can happen easily. Uh, and you try to correct for that with the B0 field map, right? But it can be even worse. It can even lead to things like that. Um, and yeah, so there somebody really did not look at the data, but like here, right? So you have these little, so where it's close to the eyes, for instance, uh, there also, uh, it, it happens a lot. It's, it's just because of the imaging technique MR itself. Uh, and then the, the last one I brought and uh, I tried to mention it before, if something is in the scanner or in the participant that does not belong there, might it be a hair needle? Might it be um, some other metal thing maybe coming from, from the teeth that is not MR capable? Then you might up with a signal like that that is causing just black holes in your, in your brain data. And then of course the algorithms are totally doomed. 
So in a good lab, of course, you would look at that, but you, I've seen already um, lab people acquiring data, overseeing things like that. Uh, so normally that's the best thing, at least for this, because this is totally useless data, right? So you, you can stop the experiment here. And if you acquire the participant, it's a waste of money and lifetime. And uh, normally you see it at the scanner console, but there are people not taking care of that. They, they just say like, yeah, it's running. Okay, go away. Um, yeah, so you would see it while acquiring the data normally. And then you can take out the participants. You can check what's going on, right? Oh, it's a hair needle. Take it out and then restart everything again. So in short, a very short summary before we go to the, to the hands on really what can I do? Uh, and you can imagine what I tell you. Look at your data. And now, let's have a look. Any questions in the chat? Not so far. So how to look at your data. And of course, for now, I, I brought you a little tool related to this fMRI uh, pre-processing. And the toolbox is called fMRI. It's based on this SMS, uh, FPM uh, toolbox um, that can do all this pre-processing and analysis of fMRI data uh, with MATLAB. Uh, and behind this toolbox is my colleague Stefan Heunis from Leiden University. And um, to some extent, I helped him developing it, but the majority of work he did. Uh, and what is the toolbox doing? So on the one side, it's running the, the steps that are necessary, but this is then using the SPM algorithms. But this is a report tool uh, with some quality matrix and visual inspection of the data. So I think this toolbox really closes a lag um, and simplifies the, the quality um, control uh, and it's open source. So anybody of you has some free time and has to deal with FMI anyway, feel free to contribute. We are definitely need people to help us because it's a lot of work. And what can this uh, toolbox do in very short? So I shortly mentioned before, there's this common data structure for FMI data, which is called bits. And this is a bits compatible workflow. So there's nowadays really a, a given structure of FMI data so that every experiment looks the same with regard to data structure. Uh, and what it's doing, it's um, doing the, the pre-processing in the background and calculating some interesting quality matrix. It visualizes the outcomes and um, it helps you how to analyze your data with the, with the batch. So, of course, what you need at the beginning uh, is a bits data structure from your data, uh, and then it, uh, it builds this analysis pipeline uh, for pre-processing and analysis. Today, we focus on a pre-processing. Okay, and now we are back to the slide that I've shown you before. Is anybody having the data, anybody having it on a computer? When I ask a question, you can use ah, wow. perfect. Um, could you open then this template file? And then my idea would be so if you open this in, in your MATLAB, then you check line four and enter your path. So from the people at home, anybody? not getting what I what I mean anybody having questions okay your problems there's no zip file okay otherwise we're running out of time so on my computer, if I, of course, I try to prepare for today, right? So if I start this now, of course, not everything is happening that should happen on your computer because it would take too long. So I did run that before to be able to show you the results. The general idea is that it's guiding you through different steps 
as you see here, that that, is, that are named volume realignment, func uh, structural functional re uh, registration, uh, slice timing, co-registration, all these things. Um, and that then, because of the, the toolbox running and doing the pre-processing, different um, results are popping up on your screen and you see that. And it's also calculating the, the physiological uh, correction values. Uh, so it's it's doing really just very small parts here on my computer. Uh, and and I hope uh, in case you can make it run either now or, or a bit later, you can you can have a look at, at this in more detail. Um, so what what comes out of it? This is the most interesting part. So we have two participants here, right? As I as I told you. Um, so what you see here now, or what you get as an output. Let's start from that maybe. So this mic is showing red. Is that an issue? Doesn't hear me. Um, so that it needs to be lower than that. I can use. Okay, button. it's uh, switched on. So. What you should end up at the at the end is this folder derivatives and there you have the prepros which contains all the preprocessing steps and the other one um, is QC and in QC for both participants, you should find the report file and the report. Is summarizing in an HTML the full output of this preprocessing so what you can open, then in a browser of your choice is this HTML file. And this is what I've done here. And then this, this shows you the, the summary of the pre-processing of this participant. So you see here the, the name of your experiment, the participant, uh, what's the resolution of your anatomy? What is the resolution of your functional data? In our case, two by two by three, uh, echo time, sense factors and tasks and run names. So, and now we, we go here, we have an anatomical QC. So what we see first is, Move this upper thing. As I told you, right, uh, the whole thing has to extract, which is really brain data. And this is what you see here. So the red covered thing is what your algorithm thinks is the brain. And this is going along some selected slices throughout your um, throughout your T1 data. And this is the overall brain mask. Uh, but then uh, for the normalization, uh, the different brain structures are extracted, uh, and one of them is the is the gray matter. So here you see what has been extracted as the gray matter, and you can see does it fit or does it not fit. Um, so is it really going along here, these outer parts, or is there an issue somewhere? And we have the second participant that I show you, right? So here this looks really really good. So um, the the red parts covering here really look like gray matter, the opposite is the white matter. So here you see that these inner parts are selected and you immediately see if there's an issue with that. Uh, and then you have also this uh, CFS uh, mask, which, which covers this uh, fluid parts. Um, and you also see here if there's an issue or not, uh, and if something is wrong with your participant. And then for the for the functional data, we have some uh, quality matrix. Uh, and the first one here is in a table, and normally this, this table is way longer. Here it's uh, shortened. Uh, so what you what you can see here uh, is first of all in in numbers the mean frame wise displacement, which is a value for the motion in the data. So on average, the participant did not move more than. 0.25 millimeters. And then the second one, 0.28, which is very good. I like this participant. Um, and then according to that, outliers are detected depending on two different thresholds, either 0.2 millimeters or 0.5 millimeters. And what's happening then for your analysis is that these volumes are taken out, the, the ones that are above this threshold, because otherwise it can harm your, your analysis. Um, then you also have mean values, global correction values, uh, T, S, and R values. And this is what we are looking at here now visually also. So this is the summary. And here we have the FMI data now. So all the slices in our brain. And first of all, we, we immediately see the, the quality of the data. So here are the eyes. And then before I told you that there are always distortions here. And there is a little distortion also like 
this little block is a distortion, but it's not too bad. So a severe distortion, you would immediately detect just at looking at this. And this is the overall time series mean. So along the whole time series, what's the mean value? And if there would something strange be going on on your timeline, you would see here either a very light or a very dark part in your, in your brain. Uh, and then we can also check for things like the standard deviation. Is there li like something that's um, destroying the signal at, at some specific place or like the temporal SNR? Uh, and this is also important, like when you're aiming for some specific regions. Uh, so what is, what is obvious is that the, the temporal SNR is, is higher at these outer brain areas than the inner brain areas, which is just given to the, to the signal itself. But if you are aiming for, I, I've shown you the this emotional thing before, right? And that's the amygdala that's somewhere here. And if you would already detect from this that your amygdala is not covered at all here with the T S and R in, in one participant for some reason, maybe a distortion, you would also see it from here already. So you would know, okay, this is an outlier in my group analysis. There, there's an, uh, there, if, if I don't have a T S and R here, then, then I have to take out for, for later analysis um and then oh wait there's one more fun thing so as i as i told you we have two runs same participant uh, lying in the scanner doing the same thing several times so here you just say okay this is run number one this is run number two and the same could work for different sessions we just have one session here but you could also switch between the sessions so you all, what you also see here is like is there a difference between the runs and apparently it's not a big difference I'll show you with the other example how it would look like. So that, that you would also immediately see. And then here we have, with the different brain tissue types, we have an, an overview along the whole time series. So, so this is showing you time, the different volumes. Uh, and this is showing you with regard to the different brain tissue. So this is the global signal. The yellow is the white uh, matter signal. And the blue is the cerebral spin fluid. Uh, and you see if within this brain tissue, according to the time series, there are some issues. And here you see an, an open end. And here you also see like, oh, there's a big contrast. So there's a movement going on. So that a participant moves ahead more than three millimeters. And then uh, we see that this is, and, and this would be then in the analysis taken out because of this outlier detection. And here you see, right? And, and this is a really good participant, uh, was lying very still. So it's rather smooth. You have one edge here um, and everything looks really nice. And then the, the last plots are the, the QC for, for the QC data. They are a bit funny, <laughs> I admit that. Um, so, so you see the, the heartbeat detection and you see a histogram of the, of the briefing and it should always look a little bit like that. So, if, rather low breathing rate if you would have another peak like here in, in, a, in a later area then the participant did something strange so if you don't have a histogram that that shows a peak at a very low level of of breathing then also your participant did something very strange um and this is now for the for the qc and within our toolbox um the the state of the art there would be more matrix to plot and this is also we continue this toolbox further um so we, we are aiming for more and we have lots of ideas for more this is what it can do for the moment and it means that for every participant uh you have one of these html thingies which summarizes along the sessions along the runs all these matrix things and now let's look at our second participant and here we already see as i as i told you i uh, he has an artificial hole, don't worry about him. Uh, and here now you already see, here looking at this picture, oh my goodness, something strange. And then if you look at these masks, you also see that, that this masking is not working. Or with regard to the hole, it's still working quite okay. <laughs> um, but at the end, this is, uh, this is not a, a proper fully brain mask. Uh, that you that you get because around the whole it's doing strange things right it's it's detail uh this this brain matter just just wrongly right so at least it's around but it also detects part of the of the whole which is just 
uh, wrong and uh, can then lead to issues during the, the normalization. So it's somewhat detecting, but it's not a proper brain mass that you're ending up with. And then we have the same uh, with the participants uh, when we when we look at the at the functional data. Uh, so the time series mean looks okayish. Standard deviation looks okayish. Temporal SNR looks okayish. But now this is one one. And now when we switch to one two, you see that the brain is switched to the to the right. So they are not comparable between the first and the second run, but they are supposed to be co-addressed to each other. So something went wrong here. So looking at this difference between these runs is also very important. And that look should look like as similar as possible. And here you see, oh my goodness, it's moving. Something is really going on that is not proper with regard to the pre-processing. Um, and then like here in the, in the signal with regard to the to the motion in the first run we again when we look here that looks quite smooth no big edges but shifting the run again so cannot show it on the on the screen everything at the at the same time so here, if we look now at the at the first run and the participant, we suddenly see, oh my goodness, there are so many edges. Uh, there are many moments where this particip participant moved a lot. So these are always outliers. And the more edges you have, the more data will be taken out during the, the analysis. So the, the worse the participant uh, performed uh, and was not lying still. And this uh, is also causing trouble then, then for your analysis. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is the frame-wise displacement value. So this is like the the distance uh, from the from the mean of uh, of your of your voxels of the, the time series and the the shift of this voxel um, given that moment of time where you are. Uh, so no, this is overall the whole. Uh, over all voxels, exactly. So of course you could do this if you if you have a specific target region in your brain. Let's say the amygdala again. Yes, it's a because otherwise you look at these things, right? You look at rotation, uh, translation, um, and you have normally six parameters, and this frame-wise displacement is a combination of all of them. So it contains three translation and three rotations, and is then weight it to one value so that you see is it is it a bad value or not so here if you see these edges in the data that corresponds to here you see that this is an open thingy so it, it could not even be plotted so the frame of displacement is big so the participants moved suddenly and unexpected uh, and then you have such a big jump in your data that you that you have to cut out this part of the data and you have to cut out this part of the data and you have to cut out this part of the data. So that, that's the normal solution. Otherwise you have these jumps in your data. Like, like whatever smoothing thing, uh, you might do so, but it's also then uh, changing your data. Yeah. With regard to your paradigm that you're relating then to these data, it's better to cut it. So two minutes left. So with regard to physio, um, I, I had a hard time to introduce an issue. So they, they look properly, but. Uh, at least with regard to motion and between the runs and the anatomy, I introduced some some issues, and I, I hope you get the idea of this uh, report and this that this really helps you in looking at one thing, one HTML, showing you all these metrics, uh, and you have a rather easy time. Even if you have sixty participants, you look at these sixty slides, and you do not do. Uh, 60 times looking at five different imaging parts, opening in different toolboxes and looking at it 
um, and, and checking all that things because it's really, really time consuming if you do everything manually without a, um, a, a helper for, for plotting. Um, and one of our future things is, so this is for, for the individual level, one of our future things that it's now on, on top of the to-do list is that we also want to report this for group level. <laughs> So that's more or less all I wanted to say. I hope some of you <laughs> learned something. And if there are questions left, please let me know. Oh, yeah, maybe we can post the questions in the box so also the online people can hear. I just wanted to know, is there a toolbox in Python for this thing? Um, in Python, I'm not aware of FSL is uh, doing something similar, but uh, FSL is a, uh, um unix linux based uh, toolbox where you run the, the scripts there i'm not sh i have to admit i didn't follow them for the for the near past maybe they put something in python meanwhile i'm it, it, it's the sni learn it's true but it, as far as i know this is not producing such a summary of the um so th that can do the the processing but I'm not aware of, uh, of, of such an output uh, that they are producing such a summary of the, of the pre-processing outputs. Maybe they do nowadays. My prep uh, is, is using the FSL version in, in the background. So they, uh, FSL started with that really early um, and that, that was always very helpful, um, but it was not available for these FPM outputs. But yeah, so if you think of, I, I more like to use FSL um, or the, the FMI prep, then it will produce outputs like that FSL based. Any more questions? And, and uh, oh. sorry, just as a summary, I don't care. All I want is you to look at the data, right? I don't care which toolbox you're using. <laughs> <laughs> Is that as a default case or only in case of mistakes? Like, always. Like, always. Default. Okay. <laughs> default. There's so many things that can go wrong. <laughs> okay, then um, thank you very much for sharing this complex analysis with us and also uh, helping us debug. Um, um, yes, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. And, and maybe you will be around for more questions. Yes. Um, just Please don't in have a coffee space. break or at lunch or if you like. Perfect.